Yeah, yeah. So we'll have to hand out. I want to do in this puzzle is to begin with saying, well, you've got the long shadow of the rise of the West <coughs> shifting a focus to what really had happened in the period, particularly 1500 to 1800. You had first in South Asia the rise in Mughal India of the world's largest ever Muslim empire. We are typically preoccupied with the Ottoman Empire from a Western perspective, but the Mughal Empire had a larger population, uh, had a larger territory, was one, along with China one of the two superpowers of its day. Subsequent to that, from the early 1600s, we see in Northeast Asia the rise of what was initially an extraordinarily insignificant proto-state in the Manchus, come to acquire dominance throughout East Asia and double the size of what was then the Chinese Empire by the late 18th century. Then finally, the British Empire taking over the remnants of the Mughal Empire at the time. Uh, this amounted to a scale shift in the dimensions of international politics at the time, the rise of empires of unprecedented size, sophistication, and in contrast to evanescent giants of the past, like the Mongol Empire, empires that typically stuck around and became institutionalised over a couple of hundred years. I'm shamelessly stealing a phrase from Daniel Nexon in calling this liminal imperialism. What was distinctive about this mode of empire building was that it was prosecuted by groups that were demographically insignificant relative to the populations that they conquered. They did not enjoy overwhelming military technological advantages. They were culturally typically regarded with a very high degree of stigma as barbarians and therefore had no overwhelming cultural charisma to be able to lubricate their conquest. And they emerged from Eurasia's steppe, sea and forest frontiers. So the puzzle that I seek to explain is how was it that both Western and Asian forms of liberal imperialism came to flourish at this time? Hence the focus of this, shifting away from an exclusive focus from the rise of the West to a focus on how the East was one, looking at the rise of the largest Muslim, East Asian and Western colonial empires and seeing these as being roughly comparable processes and projects. A couple of maps in here just to give you um, a little bit of visual diversion and also because increasingly I feel I can't give a PowerPoint without having some maps in it. Um, <laughs> what I'm seeing to illustrate with this first map is the vast shift in dimensions of what we now see as China that occurred under the Manchus. The Manchus, as we'll see, were culturally stigmatised, seen as deeply inferior by the Chinese. Yet by 1644, they had toppled the Ming Dynasty and claimed the Mandate of Heaven. In the 18th century, Qing China constituted, in terms of territory conquered, the world's most successful colonial conquest empire ever. If you look at the 20th century as the American century, the 19th century as the British century, the 18th century in terms of successful conquest clearly was the Qing Empire. Shifting then to the British Empire in India, we see that as late as 1767, the British were a relatively insignificant territorial presence. But then throughout this era, by 1805 and the end of the Second Anglo-Maratha War, they have acquired a significant degree of control over the main coastal and deltaic regions where the main wealth is concentrated. By 1858, so immediately after the Indian Mutiny, or if you prefer, the first Indian War of Independence, uh, they have been able to secure uh, dominance both directly and indirectly. Um, a relatively rapid period of conquest. But between Qing China and British India, you see the transformations that inaugurate the uh, beginnings of modern history in Asia. So that's the background. The fact that I'm almost at 120 and we're in the background phase <laughs> does not bode well. Thankfully, we now have a puzzle. So there we are. How is it possible for demographically tiny, geographically marginal and culturally stigmatised barbarians to conquer and rule commercially sophisticated and vastly more populous societies in South and East Asia? That's the central puzzle that this paper and the book seek to engage. So bring on the straw man. Existing explanations for imperial conquest. Number one, I like to think of this as this is the, the Incredible Hulk theory. 
of colonial conquest. Uh, and I say that as much because I want to get the Incredible Hulk into an academic presentation as anything else. Uh, but this is an idea that has for a long time held a very high degree of currency, which sees empires essentially as a form of macro parasite, in which you have outsiders are able to leverage some kind of unique military technological advantage in order to impose their will on others. There is some truth in this. All of the colonial conquests that I, that I present in this paper were grounded very foundationally on extraordinarily brutal wars of conquest. But one of the great mistakes that we make, in particular in focusing on Western colonial conquest, is that there is a typical tendency to read back the technological imbalances of the late 19th century into an earlier period when the West did not enjoy military technological dominance. So some of us will recall the phrase, um, we have got the Maxim gun and they have not, the idea that the West had technological supremacy by the late 19th century. But if we look at the wars of conquest that won the West control over India, these were typically fought in an extraordinarily abbreviated period from the 1760s through to 1818, in which the West did not enjoy any killer app in terms of military technological supremacy. Likewise, the Qing and the Mughals in India before them did not have anything that amounts to um, extraterrestrial style military dominance over others, mixing my science fiction and fantasy metaphors there. The second explanation, which at first glance seems quite naive, but is actually one that features quite prominently in the literature, is one that focuses on contracting and the dynamics of imperial bargains. And says, well, the reason that uh, colonial conquest regimes are able to succeed is that they are able to harness the collaboration of locals and therefore bring them into an imperial framework. Now, let me qualify from the outset that collaboration plays a critically important role in the story that I will tell. But obviously the idea that these are contracts that are benignly undertaken uh, is one that is deeply problematic and it also overlooks some of the deeper cultural foundations that helped lubricate imperial expansion. Third, this notion of cultural charisma, soft power and colonial conquest. Um, being a constructivist theory of empire formation, I place a great degree of emphasis on cultural power and soft power resources in developing my argument. But it must be stated from the outset that the process of liminal conquest actually involved as one of the chief challenges that actors faced in engaging in this form of conquest involved the self-conscious harnessing and repurposing of cultural resources from the societies that they themselves were conquering in order to be able to build up a synthetic ideology of rule in order to secure dominance. To give simply one example of this, British India relies on Persian as its language of administration down to the 1830s. Many of the early colonial conquerors of the English East India Company had Persian subriquets identified very deeply with Indo-Persian culture and it was that hybridity that actually enabled them to secure a degree of local cultural acceptance. So culture plays a critically important role in my argument but not in a simplistic way of the idea of outsiders exercising some kind of irresistible soft power uh, control over locals. Finally, this is associated with Paul MacDonald's work uh, on networks of domination, social network explanations for divide and conquer. And MacDonald's argument is essentially that when you have a high level of social and commercial connections between locals and foreigners, and when there is a high degree of indigenous elite fragmentation, this provides a critical precondition for colonial conquest. That is an argument that I do not take issue with. And in fact, structurally, it is constant with the argument that I'm about to present. But a key takeaway that I want to present in this presentation is that divide and conquer presumes define and conquer as a key element for its operation. In order to secure successful imperial expansion, it is absolutely critical as an imperative of early modern statecraft for actors during this period to be able to redefine the collective identities of local actors in ways that make them amenable to participation in colonial conquest and to enable them subsequently to identify with a broader imperial project. So, a bit of background. The argument here I'm making is that the empires that emerge 
from 1500 onwards. And the period that I'm interested in is 1500 to 1850. The preconditions for this imperial expansion are actually laid from the late medieval period in a number of ways. The first is that across Eurasia there is an increase in what Daniel Dudney refers to as violence interdependence. Now, during this period, particularly from the 11th century, we see on Eurasia's steppe and sea frontiers the development of new military technologies. The introduction of the stirrup onto the steppe enables pastoralists to, to acquire an ability to engage in Blitzkrieg-style conquest um, of the kind that we associate, for example, with Genghis Khan. Likewise, the Europeans develop a niche specialty in blue water naval warfare. This is something that is actually genuinely distinctive to the Western European experience. But so far, if we look all the way up to 1500, both nomadic pastoralists from the centre of Eurasia and European naval conquerors are typically seen as annoyances as much as anything else to the populous and successful and commercially dynamic societies of South and East Asia. But this is a critical precondition. The second is that during this period, and Janet abu Lagod and others have already written on this, the emergence of a large-scale trade in long-distance long trade in luxuries. And the spice trade is a classic example of this. Low volume, high value added trade. The reason that that is important is that it creates the arbitrage opportunities that actors can then use to potentially leverage into the war chest necessary to finance conquest. Third, during this period, yeah. Ah, I see. Thank you. Brian. It's just I was just using that as a test to see that Brian's paying attention. That is who it is. Not that I ever, not that I ever doubt you, Brian. The third, and we're used to from Norbert Elias, has written this about this idea of the civilising process, that from the late medieval period onwards there is an effort systematically on the part of European rulers to consolidate violence and to change the affect structures of warrior elites in a way that brings them into greater conformity with the requirements of modern state rule. My argument in this book is to say that that process was not confined to Europe alone. That the emergence, for example, of a chivalric culture to control warrior elites in Europe had its analogues in both East Asia, where we really see from the 13th and 14th century the modern consolidation of the Sinic civilising mission, and also in the Persephone societies of both Persia, duh, and also uh, large swathes of South Asia, providing potentially alienable normative resources for conquerors to be able to capture repurpose and harness to legitimise foreign rule. The final part is obviously so important that it disappeared off the PowerPoint slide. However, that's the background. Eurasia, by the time we get to 1500, is characterised by much greater violence interdependence, the possibility of developing militarised commercial monopolies on Eurasia's frontiers, and the existence of alienable cultural resources that may enable empire builders to capture those resources and harness them into syncretic ideologies of rule. Okay, so turning into the imperatives of early modern empire building. There aren't that many of you, you are culturally stigmatised and you're coming from the frontiers, this is going to be a really difficult thing to be able to conquer the societies that you're interested in conquering. What then are the three imperatives of early modern imperial statecraft? I'm a big fan of alliteration, so these are building, binding, and breaking. <laughs> hey, the clicks corresponded with what actually happened. I'm very excited. So the first task is to build multicultural conquest coalitions. British India was conquered primarily by Indian soldiers. 90% of the war credit that the East India Company used in order to conquer India was drawn from Indian bankers. Likewise, it was Chinese who conquered China in the process of the Manchu conquests, and more precisely a coalition of Manchu, Mongol and Chinese military entrepreneurs that were able to do that. So the first task is to be able to build a multicultural military coalition large enough to be able to facilitate conquest on a subcontinental scale. The second, having conquered, is to then develop some system of rule that is able to bind a heterogeneous cultural coalition towards imperial hierarchies. And the third is to preemptively break up the possibility of any counter-coalition from emerging. 
In a European context, we understand this very clearly as the mechanism of the balance of power. But the emergence of a fragmented state system governed by a balance of power in Europe that occurs from the 15th century onwards is, from a Eurasian standpoint, the exception rather than the rule. In South Asia, in East Asia, on the Russian steppe, it was the balance of power that failed and in empire building that succeeded. So those are the three imperatives of statecraft. That is what you need to do. Collective identities, I argue, are absolutely critical to this. And the argument that I make in the book is that define and conquer is a necessary prelude to divide and conquer. What we observe with the Mughals and then later with the British and the Qing is a very careful, very systematic process of what sinologist Pamela Crosley has referred to as the curation of imperial subjectivities that are aligned with an empire building project. The systematic manipulation of collective identities in ways that enable identification with an emerging imperial project. So define and conquer as being absolutely critical as a prelude to divide and conquer. The second element when we shift from conquest to consolidation is obviously the idea of define and rule as a critical underpinning for divide and rule. Now, for those of us that have familiarity with post-colonial scholarship, this should come as no surprise, the idea that, for example, the British systematically reshaped, for example, Hindu and Muslim communal identities in order to consolidate the cleavages upon which empire could be built. The claim that I'm making here, then, is not original in it for its own sake. It's rather the comparative application of it. I'm saying this was occurring earlier under Mughal India and also and also elsewhere with respect to Qing China. So, my clip continues to work. This is drawing directly from the work that I'm doing at the moment with Chris Rusmith. Imperial diversity regimes are a cheap mechanism for sustaining both of these logics of define and conquer and define and rule. In order to build up and sustain divide these and imperial rule. systems. Joan? Do you mean divide and rule? I do. Yes. What did I say? Define and rule. No, define and conquer and define and rule. Define and rule, not yes. divide and rule. Define and rule as a precondition for divide and rule. Right. I'm feeling I'm going to be on a who's on first skit <laughs> very quickly. Um, if it's confusing for you, it's confusing for me also. It's been, I've been three years trapped in this, marinating in my own madness. So. <laughs> so it's really a metaphor for the profession generally. But. Okay, imperial diversity regimes, brief taxonomy. Organising culture in a way to sustain colonial dominance in both... Europe in both Western and also Asian contexts. I'm going to illustrate, or I'm going to try to present the argument by way of illustration. I've got Mughal India. Emerges in 1526. Uh, the Mughals are nominally rulers of India right down to the Indian Mutiny in 1857 to 1859. Um, they are effectively in power from 1526 to 1707. There is a very distinct ideology of rule that develops during this period, one of syncretic incorporation. And to show you what I mean by this, this is Fatima Sikri, a um, famous city that Akbar built in uh, a couple of hundred kilometres uh, outside of Delhi and it was meant to embody a synthesis of all of the diverse cultures of his imperial system. He had a very distinct ideology, Suli Kul, which was peace for all, that deliberately tried to establish a system in which, the empire, in which the emperor himself would be the embodiment of a syncretic uh, combination of all of the cultures over which he ruled. Reconciliation as the goal, but the idea of embedding a very syncretic vision of cultural diversity as central to that. Second image that I want to show. This is a stele that was common in Qing China and embodies what I call an imperial system that was characterised by segregated incorporation. So if you look at the Mughals, they were very deliberate in building up their court as an acculturative mechanism that would seek to create order through deliberately melding different constituent cultures together. The Qing had a very different system. In the Qing system, the idea was very much that you would build an empire in which the emperor would discreetly embody the different cosmologies of different imperial constituencies. 
but would do so in a way that was deeply siloed. So this was a classic system of saying, well, to the Chinese, the emperor was an embodiment of the Confucian sage king. For the Tibetans, rather, he was the Bodhisattva, the embodiment of Buddha's wisdom. For the, for the Mongols, the Great Khan, etc., etc. And what we see is that this was inscribed into the very monumental architecture of the empire itself in the idea of having different languages and different faces of the empire. This has been described as a system that controlled cultures by separately incarnating them. The final image that I want to present here is this is a picture of the Delhi Durba. You've got the British monarch has come to Bombay, the gateway of India, to preside over the imperial subjects. And this embodies a system for organising cultural diversity that I understand as one of ecumenical incorporation. That is, the empire, or rather the imperial structure, sits above and is distinct and separate from the cultures over which he rules and serves as the independent, benevolent arbitrator that controls them without becoming any of them. So you've got three different models of syncretic incorporation here, of incorporation rather, syncretic, segregated and ecumenical. This is not to say that empires cannot be organised upon alternative lines. What we saw with the near-death experience for British India of the 1857 to 1859 mutiny was partially the result of a liberal project of cultural standardisation that went off the rails. You can attempt to rule through cultural standardisation rather than incorporation, but you do so at your peril. So take note would be empire builders. <laughs> So that's the model of the argument. There's a very strong degree of path dependency here. In order to conquer on a continental scale, you need to build and bind multicultural coalitions. In order to do so, you need to organise cultural diversity in ways that are going to be amenable to that project. Construction of diversity regimes enables you to do this, but these will always be articulated in particular and distinct ways. Syncretic, segregated and ecumenical as a non-exhaustive taxonomic example of that. So what does the argument look like? It looks very much like a PowerPoint slide as it would appear. I got up to 1.45? Mm -hmm. Yes, good, thank you. I was going to do that anyway, but... Um. Okay, so the two examples that I want to give very briefly to illustrate the argument. First is to note the uh, emergence of Qing China. And again, one of the things that I found most fascinating in studying this project was the sheer improbability of all of the processes of conquest that I studied. If you look at the Manchus, these are an insignificant set of actors uh, around sort of in the intersection of between, you know, where Korea and modern Korea and China are now. Um, they were for a very long time pre-literate. They were very much condescended to by the Chinese as barbarians. The great difficulty, though, for Ming China, which was characteristic of a large number of successful commercially dynamic societies at that time, was that they had a weakness for exotic foreign luxuries. Uh, ginseng was the cocaine of its day. And one of the main sources of ginseng was the area of the Manchu homeland. And there was a very clever warlord a guy by the name of Nohachi who was good at bribing local Chinese border officials to consolidate control over the trading patents that enabled him to capture control over the ginseng market. So much so that he was able to essentially monopolise the trade of ginseng to the Chinese. So by the time that we get to the early 1600s, fully a quarter of the American bullion that is going into China is going straight back out into the pockets of Nuhachi and his compatriots. This is an empire that is built on militarised commercial monopoly. And from the 1600s onwards, this proto-commercial state mutates into a much larger empire. I can get into greater detail in this later on, um, but one of the great innovations of the Manchus is what they call the banner system. This is a system of organising the military self-consciously around what we would now see as ethnic lines. So they would have different military cells that were based on the Han Chinese, the Mongols and the Manchus. This was a very deliberate and very systematic process of cultural re-engineering that sought to tap into, synthesise and combine the respective military strengths of different peoples. So the Mongols, experts in cavalry warfare, at the same time Chinese 
experts in artillery and had the heft to be able to provide large-scale infantry resources. But having established what was essentially a functional military institution, this then lays the cultural template for the empire that follows. After that, we see the emergence of, as I've said, an empire as a form of segregated incorporation. And again, because I like alliteration between the Middle, Middle Kingdom and the Manchu way. The Manchus constantly navigate a tension between being self-consciously an alien conquest dynasty. They become obsessed with the idea of not becoming soft and sedentarized like the Chinese, while at the same time, nevertheless, trying to maintain a system that enables them to harness, sustain and maintain an elaborate system of local collaboration. A key element of this is their ability to essentially um, eat and reassemble <coughs> existing indigenous resources. So the very fact that there is the world's most sophisticated meritocratic bureaucracy in China, that becomes a resource that they are able to harness, repurpose and reintegrate to their own system. Likewise, turning to my second example, British India. East India Company is built on a system of maritime uh, arbitrage. Um, I like to see the East India Company as the world's most successful ever narco state. It was originally built, obviously, with a view towards capturing control of the spice trade. Uh, unfortunately, it turned out that the Dutch were bigger, meaner and tougher than them, so they were able to shift temporarily to textiles and then later tea, and then finally finding their groove in the early 19th century with the opium trade to China. But the whole system was one that was built on militarised commercial maritime monopoly. Again, some parallels with the Manchus there, this being a maritime rather than terrestrial variant. The company succeeds, though, because it is able to build a hybrid military establishment. I know, I got excited. <laughs> uh, I get excited about this, too. <laughs> a little too excited sometimes. Uh, British, as we know, they win because they are able to harness what is, at the time, and in fact, historically to this day, was the world's largest ever market for mercenaries. When the East India Company shifts towards a policy of outright territorial conquest from the 1760s, they do so in a subcontinent that is bristling with private military labour. And part of their success is to be able to use their superior creditworthiness to position themselves as employer of choice to India's mercenaries. They're able to position themselves in such a way as to acquire at first monopsonistic control over that market, and then once that conquest has occurred, they are then able to essentially dismember the remaining market for mercenaries. But a critical part of that was building identities, martial identities that enabled local military actors and entrepreneurs to identify with the British state, or are the East India Company state. And what is fascinating about this is exactly how hybrid and mestizo this was. So we take one example, take the example of the uh, takeover of the conquered and ceded territories around Delhi. Um, the British East India Company is very, the English East India Company is very explicit at harnessing the remaining cultural charisma of the Mughal Empire and attaching it to themselves in a way that replicates Mughal practices of um, the imperial court, but does so in a way that enables them to magnetically draw in the military elites necessary for them to make their empire. A final point to simply observe here is that when it comes to actually articulating a diversity regime, um, the analogy I've used here, and it was one that British imperialists themselves used, was that this was an empire in the mould of Justinian. The idea of saying, well, what is the foundation for British imperial authority? Unlike the Manchus, unlike the Mughals, they could not simply masquerade as a divine embodiment of um, some sort of cosmological principle. They were that culturally different from the populations that they conquered that that would have been very difficult to pull off. But instead, and this is something that comes from Hastings onwards, there is the idea of saying, well, the British system is based on a form of ecumenicism, but it is a form of ecumenicism that deliberately secures rule on the basis of saying, we will be lawgivers in the mould of Justinian, and our imperial project will be codifying distinct ang so-called Anglo-Mohammedan and Anglo-Hindu systems of law to embody very radically different conceptions of political community that the British are able to reconcile in a particular imperial order. There is a terrific statue in Calcutta of Hastings 
standing resplendent in a Roman toga, so deliberately evoking the image of the Romans, and sitting to one side of him is an Indian pandit recording Hindu law, and on the other side, a Persian Malvi recording anglo mohammedan law. That embodiment of this idea of a particular model of imperial incorporation. So in the remaining two minutes that I have, implications. So the first thing that I want to emphasise is the importance of customization as the foundation of imperial hierarchy. By customization, I mean this idea that what is central to imperial statecraft is the project of identity manipulation and that this is something that is not distinct or unique to the Western colonial project. It is rather a project that is enabled as a result of changes in late medieval Eurasia and is common across South and East Asia among both Western and Eastern imperialists. Second is an important point about comparative imperialism and global history. Um, again, we are very typically used to associating a particular model of history that is anchored around the idea of the rise of the West. The reality is we enter into a historical period in which, again, it will be Asian powers that are primary. The period of Western dominance will be seen as a brief historical moment. I argue that it is actually really helpful and really useful for us to contextualise that by realising that up until 1800 at least, Western empires were latecomers who shared the stage with their Asian counterparts and succeeded, and this is the mimetic basis of Western imperialism, succeeded precisely on the basis of mimicking the same strategies of imperial statecraft that Mughal and Qing actors had modelled before them. And finally, what does it mean for today? Absolutely nothing. This is an entirely historical project. And um, no, the, reason, the reason I say that is that the, the initial DECRA project that won me the money that enabled this grand indulgence was built around the belief that if you understood the logic of early modern empire building, you would understand the contemporary security anxieties of India and China. That is that the, these would be fragile states primarily preoccupied with the possibility of internal disintegration and that therefore one could understand their security culture as a result of looking at early modern colonial history. It turns out that that is bullshit. <laughs> Partially. In that it resonates, to the extent that it does, much more in the context of the contemporary People's Republic of China which remains to this day obsessed with the idea of controlling and managing cultural diversity in a deeply repressive and oppressive way, versus India, which seems to be much more reconciled to diversity in a way that has been less uh, inhibiting of them in adopting a more extroverted view towards the international system. Um, a puzzle I have yet to explain, but one that the ARC might like to help me with by funding a successor project. And on that money-grubbing note. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. That was fantastic. Okay, I sense there's going to be a lot of eager hands going up, so may I please ask you all to keep your uh, questions succinct. Thank you. Yes, at the back. Hi, obvious question, Andrew. Yep. You've been touched on this a little bit. Was the East actually one? We talked about the transitory phase that you just touched on the end. Mm. And that the political structures that have emerged in China in the era are not exactly what we call westernized political structures. Was it one? Mm. Okay. Second point, um, I wonder about the labeling. You talk about mm. Hindu Empire as a Muslim empire, but then you then proceed to talk about Akbar the Great. Yeah. Who saw Islam and Hinduism as compatible with the vast majority of Hinduism. Do you, do you touch on this in the book? Mm. And third point, mm. it's not entirely pointless. I'm sure you must be aware of the work of Khamenei Devashi. Um, mm -hmm. He talks about the idea of looking into these kind of cosmopolitan empires, the Ottoman Empire, the Persian Empire, and the Mughal Empire, as kind of not as a model, but a kind of an idea that within these kind of conflict zones in the Middle East, for instance, which is my area, that this could be you know, a, a, an idea that there is a possibility for communal existence across various nations and religions and empires and so forth. So, why don't you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. So, terrific questions. I will. Um race through them very quickly. Um, was the East one? Yes, to the extent that um, to make sense of the contemporary world, you need to account for the unusual gigantism of contemporary India and China. 
And the argument that I that I would, do, would sustain is to say, well, you actually can't make sense of that without observing these processes of comparative colonial conquest in the early modern period. So you've got these giant lumps of power. How did they become giant? How did they remain durable? My argument there is to say, well, that that's the kind of processes that I'm trying to explain. So brief first would be, how did China and India get to be so big and to stay so big? Um, Second question in terms of the Mughals, yeah, that's a really important one. This is, it doesn't identify as an Islamic empire. Um, it's useful in terms of uh, justifying to book reviewers a logic of case selection, the great biggest Muslim, East Asian and Western empires. Um, I, I, take, I take the point advisedly and also with, with an observation. Part of what the book does is that it compares the rule of Akbar with the rule of Aurangzeb. Okay, well, once you get to a wrong set, that is someone who doesn't care that the majority of his population are non-Muslim, insists on a much more clearly Islamic identity um, to the detriment of the empire as a whole. And I argue that process actually destroys the diversity regime. The fine po final point in terms of the cosmopolitan imaginaries that informed these early empires, um, I'm really sceptical of some of the dangerous romanticism and nostalgia that can come with that, in that you know, even under the great... Akbar, who was the embodiment of kindness and love and embracing different cultures, um, there was a huge degree of violence, a huge degree of oppression. Um, this uh, colleague of mine, Aisha Zarakol at Cambridge University, is doing great work at the moment on the Ottomans, and saying, okay, well, yeah, there was a degree of pragmatic pluralism at a certain point, but a lot of the time it wasn't anchored in principle. Um, and a lot of the time also it oscillated between pluralism in certain eras and much more coercive centralisation, standardisation in others. Um, that's something that the book doesn't directly engage, but it's certainly a point that is uh, worth noting. So thanks. Shaha? Yeah, thanks, Howard. That was really great. Um, <clears throat> the question, I guess, uh, is to do with uh, the role of Islam in the story, mm -hmm. uh, something you haven't touched on. Yep. Uh, now, and that relates to your argument that there is a mimetic logic here, so I'd like to maybe push you a little bit on that. Yep. Uh, the, uh, I think the big difference between the European empires and the uh, other empires you mentioned is actually the fact that they sort of grew alongside the rise of capitalism as well. It's something that, mm. this is well, system theory we'll talk about in mm. quite a bit of detail. It's very problematic in many ways, but it is an argument that I think is worth engaging with to, to an extent. Now, um, I guess the difference is that, um, you know, if you look at those maps you showed, uh, you can see that some British in India grew far more rapidly at a point mm. where British capitalism was also at its peak as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe I think there is something there that I think is worth reflecting on, given that there are also other European empires as well, with roughly the same period. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, it's a great point. I'll give my 30-second version of where my differences lie with it. Um, the key part of the literature review, obviously, is having to engage with that Marxist tradition. Um, and I'm very fortunate that um, Alex Anivis and his co-author have written a book very recently called How the West Came to Rule, which mm. provides a template for engaging with the Marxist position. Um, and so it was very useful because you've got a foil that is directly on point that emerges out of that tradition. And the thing that I noted once you read between the lines, they're obviously relying on a notion of uneven and combined development. Um, but in the awkward nomenclature that is characteristic of Marxism, when you actually get down to the brass tacks of what their argument is, they talk about the notion of geopolitical combination, that the British are ultimately able to conquer India because of their military technological supremacy. Um, and that is an argument that is, uh, has been disputed by the military historiography. So there's, there's, a, there's, a point on, there's a point on that in terms of the actual Marxist force that I've dealt with look on closer inspection a lot like realism, a lot more like realism than they should. Second point, though, just very briefly on that. Um, yeah, you're right. Obviously, capitalism plays a huge role. But if I, were to, if I was to qualify it, I'd say, well, if you just want to get finicky about timelines here, um, British India, with the exception of Punjab, is pretty much conquered by 1818. Um, and by most benchmarks, that is really before the Industrial Revolution seriously gets going. Um, so I'm open to the idea of engaging with, uh, well, if, if we're talking about sort of, you know, the factory-driven, steam-engine-driven industrial revolution, um, it's not there by 1818, and the conquest has already happened. So um, I don't dispute those accounts, but I think the first cut version of them is relatively easy to knock down. Thank you, Andrew. Cindy? Yeah, 
Thanks. Um, I would say that that earlier era is more in line with the cancels and not with yeah. late industrialism. And that's yeah. the key point there. Um, fabulous story. Mm -hmm. Great typology. Mm -hmm. Love the alliteration. Mm -hmm. It sounds very instrumental. So mm -hmm. I'm interested in how much of these forms of engagement are strategic. Mm -hmm. They know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They're serendipitous. And mm -hmm. I know this is a macro project. So. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, how do you deal with that? Uh, with great difficulty mm -hmm. um, and it's a it's one of those frustrating things that it's, it, this is a puzzle I've been trying to engage for a few years and um, I'll just put my cards on the table I've never been able to develop a satisfactory response to that because as soon as you articulate the argument in schematic terms um, it acquires a degree of agency and self-consciousness and Machiavellian calculation that doesn't exist once you actually drill down to the contingency of the historical process itself so there are certainly passages that you can draw out where it's very explicit, for example, by the time that you get to um, you know, the Earl of Mornington in the early 1800s. So you know, this is sort of the period of the Second Anglo-Maratha War. Um, he's very much committed at that point to, and using the language that we're used to, of explicitly saying the balance of power system in India is not going to uphold our interests, only a strategy of paramountcy will be able to prevail. So there are moments that you can actually cut into the historical narrative and say, yeah, this is totally instrumental, totally Machiavellian power politics. Um, but the problem is, is that in all of the cases that I look at, that actually happens in a fairly advanced point in the conquest process. That, you know, if you're going back to the conquest of Bengal, which really gave them control of the most wealthy deltaic region on the subcontinent, um, this war is much more opportunistic, much more accidental, much more contingent. So theoretically, when I've tried to deal with that, um, I've ended up having to kind of fudge it of saying, well, you've got practice emergent processes that eventually shade into more self-conscious practices of imperial rule. Um, but as soon as you make that concession, it creates an exocet missile to fire through my own argument. Um, and I have found no way to actually defend against that at the moment. I mean, I think that there's probably another article to be written about um, degrees of self-consciousness and agency when it comes to empire formation. Mm -hmm. The one thing I will note finally, though, is that that contradiction was evident across every case that I looked at. There was always a period of about 20 to 30 years where people were empire building without actually being consciously aware of it. And then there is a shift where suddenly it's like, yep, this is what we're trying to do. Thanks, Andrew. So not even in the context of define and rule? Well, this is it, is that there's, you start to see the practice develops before the strategy does. And typically you've got its agents that are on the ground that are, there's this, there's this terrific guy, um, uh, Skinner was his name, who was, this is, and it's almost like out of um, you know, a, a comic book. He was the uh, son of a Scottish Highlander and a Rajput princess. And he was familiar with both Western and Eurasian cultures. And he ended up being one of the great brokers that enabled the British conquest of the conquered and ceded provinces and was deliberately improvising and manipulating and harnessing Mughal idioms of rule, Mughal patterns of dress, etc. Mm. And so the argument from the specialist historians is to say, well, people like that actually helped yeah. create what the aggregate is that became the empire. Um, but it's difficult to attribute to them any degree of big picture strategic agency in that. Thank you. Sorry, I don't know your name. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, Umar, I uh, uh, think I'd uh, like to ask about uh, that in some points, uh, you mentioned about uh, imperial conquest and colonial conquest. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if uh, imperialism and colonialism is the same or there are different projects uh, that was articulated by the British and, and the Chinese. And the second is, I think, uh, I'd like to know about the role of uh, the so-called tributary system, mm -hmm. uh, which I think uh, also manifests some of indirect rule mm -hmm. uh, by, by the Chinese uh, mm -hmm. to, to govern and to expand as political rule. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, this tributary system is also uh, explaining uh, how uh, Asia, uh, the rise of Asia was won in, 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 in the 16th and 15th century. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, on the question of imperial versus colonial conquest, um, I use them haphazardly and interchangeably, and that is an intellectual limitation on my part. 
<laughs> which I'll concede from the outset. Um, I think to, your more, to the more substantive question though of the role of the tributary system in this, um, I engage the question of the tributary system with a great degree of hesitance and reluctance given that as an idea it has been one of the most foundational in the way that Westerners think about East Asian international politics. Um, so just as a refresher, the tributary system is the idea that China rules through being able to position itself as being on top of the hierarchy. Uh, Actors come and kowtow and pay tribute to China and they get material benefits in return. Um, Popularised by uh, Fairbank, the historian, it has been absolutely ripped to shreds conceptually by subsequent generations of sinologists. Where I think there is a parallel, and that's something that you actually touch on there, is in the idea of indirect rule as a practice that is common to both the British Empire and the Qing Empire. And to illustrate that simply by way of example, uh, approximately 40% of British India is ruled indirectly through the 600 princely states, where they alienate prerogatives of war making and diplomacy to the British in exchange for a degree of protection. Uh, the Qing maintained a very similar system in their what they call their Lifan Yan, which has been translated as the Office of Colonial Affairs. So in we're talking here areas of Central Asia. They were very explicit about having a system of saying, well, the locals, you pretty much do your own thing, but you do not have control over war making or diplomacy. So the structural analogies there are very strong. And what's interesting and common to both is that what you often see is that creeping territorial conquest emerges gradually from a process of what starts as diplomacy between equals that then shifts towards a pattern of security patron-client relations and then matures in the form of direct territorial annexation. So the parallels there are much stronger. And so my response on the tributary system would be, well, there wasn't much of a tributary system, but where the parallels were there, they were actually really strong. There was a certain early modern way of conquest. Thank you. Martin? Thanks, Andrew. That was fascinating. Two questions. One, um, do you need to supplement this with a um, historicization of empire formation. Mm -hmm. Clearly, empires are not, you know, an empire in the 19th century is not the same as an empire in the 16th century. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, what I'm gunning for here is the internal experience of rule and how it shifts. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that's kind of partly um, something that in your story needs to get a little bit more of a look in than you've probably given it here. But mm -hmm. I would be interested in what you say about it. Second, on the deliberate thing and the stratagem, um, it struck me that there is perhaps one thing to keep in mind, which is the frame has to be available. It doesn't have to be necessarily a built-in strategy, but the frame goes right back to the 14th century in mm. the case of the British, mm. and the frame is not available to the Portuguese. They turn up in the same place, that they meet some of the same people, they don't get it off the ground, mm. right? But the British do, mm. and the frame in Britain was, was uh, done in Ireland, where define and mm. rule is you become uh, Irish, Gaelic, Catholic, uh, we remain whatever, mm. Norman, Anglican, this, that, before mm. we get even Protestantism off the ground, right? mm. but you get a, a clear uh, way, of, and it's completely constructivist. Mm. You have to just perform as if you are belonging to the ruling part, never mind, mm. no ethnic, whatever, but it is clear that it doesn't work, mm. but the idea has to be there. Yeah. You can do something like this. Mm. So we are all one under God, but some are lesser than and other, um, others are not. That's a really interesting kind of mm. a frame that the Portuguese don't have. Mm. Yeah, look, th those are two terrific interventions. Um, and what they've demanded that I do in the book is to be very precise yeah. about specifying the scope conditions of the argument. Um, I'm making not a general theory of empire formation, but a theory of how early modern territorial conquest empires came to be in the context of Eurasia. Um, the backstory to that is that I actually presented John Haslam with two versions of the book. And I said, oh, I can do this really big book on empire and it'll be fine and I'll get to look at the Americas comparatively with Asia. And in you know, his inimitable fashion, he said, I like the Asian one better. Mm -hmm. so, okay, well, so that sort of, that limits it. Um, but yeah, I certainly agree that these, the temporal parameters of this project are essentially really looking at 1500 to 1850. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the reason is precisely because of what you were saying. And in fact, to go back to Shaha's point earlier, if we're talking about you know, the role of capitalism in shaping empire, um, I find that argument for me becomes much more irresistible from the mid to late 19th century onwards than it does previously. Um, one of the th claims that I'm toying with actually drawing out in the conclusion actually on this is to say, well, 
one of the benefits of reframing it as how the East was won and pushing British India back into a category with Mughal India and Manchu, Manchu China is to say, well, people have seen Western imperial expansion in Asia as being the spearhead of modernity. Well, we need to re really rethink what it is that we mean by modernity, that in fact there is something characteristically antique about British India that warrants that kind of comparison with its, um, these other precursors. Thank you. Yes? Yeah. Right, thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, right, Andrew, I want to find out uh, to a specific uh, event in the past, which is the Second Opium Wars, mm -hmm. uh, which took place in the 1856 until 1860. Mm -hmm. Well, apart from ceding more territories, particularly the Hong Kong territory to the uh, British uh, mm -hmm. Empire, uh, one of the significant effects of that uh, particular war was that the Qing Empire had to give or to grant the three particular European powers, the British, French, and the Russian, uh, permanent diplomatic uh, presence in Beijing, mm -hmm. uh, which is something the Qing Empire had tried to resist to the bitter end because it suggested an equality between the Qing Empire mm -hmm. and the uh, European powers. I wonder whether this particular event could be like a watershed that mm -hmm. actually dignify or signify the uh, time frame where the East was actually won, as mm -hmm. at least from the Western perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a terrific question, um, and I say that because I can answer it. Um, <laughs> brief shout out, I wrote an article on the Second Opium War that I was very proud to publish in European Journal of International Relations, woohoo, made everyone very happy, particularly me, that has been cited precisely six times, five of them by me, so <laughs> the lesson out of this is don't have the opium wars in the title of an article. That's at least the lesson I'm taking out of it. Um, to you, we're going to go read it. <laughs> Thank you. That was kind of the point. Everyone cite it and we'll, we'll all be happy. At least I will be. Um, I agree with you that the second opium war is a really important inflection point, but not for reasons that people typically associate it with. Because you're right, like there's traditionally a narrative that says, well, that's a break point where after the second opium war, China... English school style is press gained into participation in a Western dominated international order. Uh, the chapter, the last empirical chapter of the book, which I'm now writing, actually looks at well, what exactly happened in East Asian order after the Second Opium War. And yes, it is true that the West was able to establish a much greater degree of represent, representation and control in East Asia. But what is also true, and what people typically forget, is that you've got a period in the 1850s where there is a very large-scale disintegration of imperial orders in both India and China. You've got the Indian mutiny in India, surprisingly, which um, is a near-death experience for British India. And concurrent with that, you've got the Taiping Rebellion in China, which is the world's largest ever civil war, 20 million people killed. Um, after 1860, the British are very explicit at pursuing what they call a cooperative policy with the Qing government that essentially involves a degree of Western technocratic participation but with an effort to try to revive and preserve the Qing dynasty as much as possible. So the aim that I actually make in the book is that what you actually have post 1860 is a conservative reinvention and restoration of imperial rule in both British India and in Qing China. So what's significant after 1860 in East Asia is not that suddenly there is a more obtrusive Western presence than before but rather there is a resilience and reinvention of that traditional order that lasts all the way down to the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95. Thank you. Federica? Thank you, Andrew. It was awesome. Oh, thank you. It's not my area at all, so I'm not going to make any comments about the content. Mm -hmm. But maybe a point about the limited significance of, um, of this for, you say, making sense of modern Asian geopolitics, yeah. right? So, um, so I was wondering whether there is any scope to think about how these systems that you are describing are actually still going on. Like I'm mm. not, I can't really speak for, for the Chinese one, but mm. definitely in the case of British imperialism and colonization, which arguably are still pr projects that are still ongoing, mm. you, can you can talk about ma martial, martial races still being used yeah. in the British uh, army and the British military. Mm. You can talk about, uh, what do I have here? You can talk about the creation of imperial subjectivities that is still an ongoing project, as well as the defining rule uh, 
Yeah, so I, I, like the way that you, like when you were talking, I just thought that all these things have a, uh, a resonance still these days. Maybe not in relation to, like I, I'm not an expert in knowledge. I don't know mm. anything about China or India, but definitely there is something to be said about uh, the British Empire today. Oh yeah, absolutely, and um, it's I, I really concur with your observations there. That there's um, I, I think it's one of those sort of fascinating things with a, a project where the intuition that I had at the start turned out to be dead wrong in terms of well, you can make something sensible and intelligible about Chinese and Indian foreign policy today by making sense of their imperial histories as post-imperial giants, um, and it turned out that that just doesn't stand up. Um, but where it does seem to stand up much more is in particular in the internal governance patterns of those states. Um, and obviously with the, it's very clear in India in terms of the continuing salience of a communal divide that was in large part generated by British occupation. Um, but it's also, it's increasingly evident in the way that the Chinese Communist Party tries to manage cultural diversity in places like Xinjiang. Um, that you know, you've now got these very calcified conceptions of collective identity that the revolutionary state has internalised in ways that are um, you know that, that are extraordinarily oppressive. The final thing I'd say on that, which I find really interesting, is that you can see that sort of model of imperial ecumenicism that the British had was I use ecumenicism deliberately in terms of accenting the centrality of religious identities, and you can see that in the kind of political cleavages that dominate in South Asia versus the Qing were very much focused on what we would now identify as ethnic identities. And you can see that in the forms of internal classification that characterise the um, revolutionary communist state. So I absolutely agree with you. It's, uh, there are those continuities there, it's just that they weren't the continuities that I, I and the ARC banked on. <laughs> um, I'm looking for a couple of other questions, but I, may I? Okay, Al. Are you going to give the ERC your money back? No. <laughs> no, I'm, in fact, I'm going to ask them... I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say to them that the main significance remains to be acquired through further funding. <laughs> yeah. I, have a, I have a real question yeah. about methods. Like, I love listening to you because it's, it's so different from what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to know, it's just a point for my own interest about the method you go through in your producing your findings, mm -hmm. and whether or not and to what extent you have a balance between sources that confirm what the rulers were doing and their purpose and intent, which I would imagine most of the sources do, mm. uh, versus the rules. Mm. In other words, you know, your claims are very much centred on cultural diversity and yeah. adaptives. The adaptation of social networks and how they hardwire into society, so yeah. do you have that kind of valid, you know, large volume of ed uh, uh, evidence from the room, from those cultures, and what do they say about being hoodwinked, or are they quite happy to give their legitimation away, or, you know, what's the balance in your, in your net? Yeah, the micro foundations of my argument are non-existent. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's very much a top-down model in terms of understanding empire. Um, I mean, in terms of we could prattle on about my inadequacies for days, um, but I'll just confine myself here to the ones that are method-related. Um, I don't have expertise in the languages that are required to get into the archives. Um, the one brief acquaintance I had with the English East India Company archives in London made me even more respectful of historians than I already was, and even less inclined to try to reinvent myself as a historian. Um, so the, the predominance of the evidence is essentially trying to arbitrage obscure knowledge that I get from reading a very large number of secondary sources, which is why the project's taken so long, and then trying to retranslate that back to an IR audience. Mm -hmm. What that means though, and I think that you're right, is that a weakness of it is that if I'm looking at these sources, most of them, particularly in the cases of Qing China and also in uh, relation to Mughal and British India, um, they are very much the view from the court. And one of the difficulties, but also one of the ways I've tried to get around that is, and I'll just use one example very briefly here. There was a very strict hierarchy that the Mughals maintained. It was called the Mansabdari system, which was their effort at a form of centralised patronage of bringing essentially the top warlords of South Asia together. Um, 
And the specialist historians I've read have actually said, well, the Mansab Dari system was the empire. That a very small number, and you know, he estimates it as out of a population of 150 million at the time in 1600, very small number, about 8,000 are incorporated into the top echelons of the Mansab Dari system. To understand the politics of it, and to understand that thin scheme of authority that was stretched over the subcontinent, that's what you need to look at. Um, so that would be my kind of plea there of saying, well, to understand the kind of puzzle that I'm looking at, you actually, these kinds of resources are sufficient. Um, but to understand how it was actually experienced by the ruled is uh, beyond my ken. Got Shaha, but I'm going to... Oh, Andrew, go ahead. Thanks. Um, terrific talk, thank you. Um, you spoke about the parameters of, of the project being 1500 to 1850. Mm. Um, and I think you mentioned towards the end that um, the pattern of empire formation that you sketch out is one that's mimicked later. Um, and, you know, by realising that, we help helps us move away from the narrative about the rise of the West and, mm. and more how these people went. Could you say a little bit about how that pattern is mimicked after the period that you're um, mm -hmm. looking at? Maybe? Yep. So, uh, mimicked by whom? Well, I guess that's the question. Yep. I'm not sure of the answer to, but yeah. unless I've misunderstood what you're saying, you're saying the patterns that you're identifying mimetic imperialism between mm -hmm. these three different mm -hmm. movements are also ones that come back into play in world politics after 1850. Yeah, the, the, the argument that I'd make is that there's, um, there's trace elements that exist, and it goes back to Federica's point earlier, there's trace elements that exist in the way that these states politically organise themselves after that. Um, the reason I've confined it temporally very specifically to 1500 to 1850 is I think there's a preparation phase, which is the late medieval period, hence that Eurasian transformation. There's the period of high subcontinental empire building, which is 1500 to 1850. Um, and then the, the initial scope of the book actually extended up to 1950 because I was trying to make sense of, well, if you've got this is how these orders come about, how do they disintegrate? Um, and the argument that I had made there is that Customization is key to enabling the construction of imperial identities, but then through a process of normative jujitsu, you've then got local subaltern elites then harness Western cultural resources back at them. So, and I was going to study the emergence of the modern Congress Party, the emergence of the Kuomintang as expressions of that. Um, and I ran out of words and interest. Uh, that was also the feedback I got from the initial reviewers of saying the stuff that you've got on empire formation and consolidation, that's theoretically original. The stuff that you've got on empire decline and the reconfiguration of those processes is a lot less original. Um, and I know when I'm beaten. So I was like, okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Just makes it for a shorter book. Thanks. Sarah? So two things. One is that I think that Actually, in your answer to Cindy's question, I think what's interesting, the degree of continuity you have, is that you have this period of unconsciousness where mm. people are kind of being imperialists without even realizing it, and mm. then the moment where they realize it. And that, to me, is really interesting. I don't know yeah. the project well enough to know what you can make of that. But the fact that it happens across all of your cases is really interesting. Yeah. People don't, by design, go in and intend to be imperialists. They yeah. start doing it and then kind of work out what they're doing. So that's just one comment where I think mm. it's really interesting. The other one is, what about the Romans? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how does this fall? How does this line up? Or do you have anything even to say about how it lines up to the Roman Empire? Um, on the second point, no. I don't know the Romans well enough. <laughs> I read SPQR. So I thought I sh should read something up on the Roman Empire. Um, and there's some interesting stuff on the organisation of cultural diversity in that. Um, but one of the things that I was always reluctant about, and again, it kind of limits the scope conditions of the argument, is whether or not there would be a comparability between the world of antiquity mm. and the contemporary or the, the world of 1500 to 1850. Um, so I, I, I'm keen to actually read up more on the Romans, both to buff up the conclusion, but also because it's intrinsically interesting. Mm. Um, on the first point, in terms of the degree of self-consciousness of empire, um, that was one of the things that actually surprised me the most about the project because obviously I, I went into it thinking, well, yeah, there's got to be a point where you say we're big bad and we're trying to take over. Um, and there is, but it just seems to be, it seems to be far later. And typically when you've got these liminal conquerors becoming much more thoroughly acquainted mm -hmm. with pre-existing imperial forms of cultural capital. So if you look, for example, at the Manchus, they're happy to be roving bandits and just 
tear up stuff as warlords until they are convinced by Chinese bureaucrats to lay claim to the Chinese mandate of heaven. And there's suddenly a moment of Damascene conversion, if you like, forgive the geographical displacement, where they say, actually, yes, we are trying to build an imperial project. Um, and I think, and it relates back also to Cindy's point earlier, um, it's, for me, it's intriguing, and I don't have an explanation for it yet. Mm. Um, so. I'm going to bring in those who haven't asked any sure. questions. Richard? Oh, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. That was a yeah, wonderful tour of uh, well, large swathes of history and, and also the internal machinations in your head, which um, <laughs> <laughs> are really interesting. Right. <laughs> um, I guess, in a way, picking up a couple of comments from, in a way, Cindy and, and Al, about um, really about method and about mm. what your purpose is. Mm. Um, I wonder whether it matters at all for the kind of macro history that you're doing when and if actors became conscious of mm. anything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that seems to me beside the point or redundant in a macro historical, mm. sociological enterprise of the kind that you're engaged in. Mm. It matters for historians. And it matters if we want to ask questions about what people thought they were doing. Mm. But that's not a question that necessarily arises in macro-historical research. Yeah. So I guess you know, one way to answer the question that Cindy asked is to say, well, it depends. Mm. If you want to be a historian, maybe it matters when they became conscious of um, what they were doing and when they started to describe their actions Mm. conduct as imperial um, but for a theoretical enterprise which is large scale and macro historical mm. what you're looking for uh, is something else that yes. happens presumably um, that tell you something about the movement of history mm. rather than the actions of particular actors so I wonder if that mm. is one way that you can start to think about what, what it is mm. that you're doing with yeah. this project is to start to separate out the kind of theoretical determination mm. of the past mm. from an empirical historical approach. Mm -hmm. So maybe more comment. If you, if you. Can I respond? Yeah, I mean, that's, thank you. That's far more clever than I could muster. <laughs> um, that's actually, I really appreciate it. That's really helpful and generative and I'll give it some more thought. I think, um, and I'm certainly, I, pr I present this project, I think it's about, it's about another year away from completion, so there's still quite a lot of thinking to be done on it. Um, at the moment, I remain quite dissatisfied with it as a project because um, kind of picking up on some of the points being raised, at the moment for me, the difficulty is that, you're right, I am making an argument in the tradition of macro historical sociology. Um, each chapter covers a period of about a century. Um, and so the agency, as a result, is bled out of that pretty quickly. Um, well, the agency just becomes a theoretical category. Yeah. Actually refer to real actors. And I, I think for me, the why I'm very apprehensive about the argument at the moment is that I think that there's a tension between that historical scope and ambition versus a theoretical argument which, uh, co completely against my initial in intuition or inclination, has become quite intentionalist in its flavour. Um, and so I think probably you know, that's an area where I actually need to rethink possibly the emphasis in the theoretical component of the argument. Um, but I really appreciate that intervention. That's actually given me some categories to actually think through it. So thank you. So I've got Shaha and Martin, but I've got myself on the list and David has come on now. So um, Andrew, I was just you know, to the conversation here. I mean, if you think about triangular trade and enslavement and, you know, um, and so on, you can give a macro-historical take on that. But you can also, you know, then interpret that as enslavement, right? Mm -hmm. So there can be a normative and, you know, an evaluation of power, disposition, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'm maybe reinforcing what Richard's saying, but even from that macro-historical perspective, you can still say that was enslavement, right? Mm -hmm. Enslavement was quite important here. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a comment um, or a question. I'm not sure. How does that inflect you know, your analysis? And I'm thinking here about 
Chakrabarti's work mm. on provincializing Europe, and he goes down to the micro level, mm. right? So the East India Company clearly had intent on some things, and Chakrabarti demonstrates mm. the kind of micro level social transformation that comes with it. So that, that was one observation. Does it at all figure in your work? Um, the last one was on cultural incorporation. Mm -hmm. This, he said, was quite important, define and rule and, and part mm -hmm. of d divide and rule. But at what point does the cultural incorporation aspect change? Because I know Tyne Fisher writes about Britain's uh, other civilizing mission, where local British people were prohibited from going native, right? Mm -hmm. And you had the workhouses, they were taken in and they couldn't just local, right? So th there, was, there were rules of how mm -hmm. the British were governed, how they would be seen, they would have to retire at 55 and all of this, right? So mm -hmm. when does that change mm -hmm. to then define this difference? Mm -hmm. And why, maybe? Okay, um, those are really terrific questions. I'll only take on one of them, which is just sort of that last one in terms of you know, when those dynamics change. Um, the thing I find most fascinating about the early conquest period is the very strongly, for want of a better phrase, mestizo character of the cultural identity of the conquerors, that they are very self-conscious and very open about the idea of taking on and adapting for themselves the cultures of the people that they're conquering. So I mean, a classic example of that is you know, the early British colonials like Warren Hastings take the idea of wearing of using shampoo because that's shampoo is an Indian word by the way mm. thinking okay well you know what an exotic practice that might be and then that diffuses <laughs> out um, versus you compare it to that post 1850s period where there's very much a focus on racial biological superiority and very sharply demarcated cultural difference as a point of distinction um, and at the moment I don't have a cross case explanation as to why that happens but simply to note that there does seem to be, from a temporal pattern, a very common trajectory where you've got the initial conquerors are very self-consciously and promiscuously cosmopolitan, and that actually is critical to their ability to engage in a process of ideological and normative and cultural outreach. And then there's some point at the post-conquest consolidation phase where they have to walk a tightrope between <coughs> maintaining imperial collaboration but reinforcing and more deeply institutionalising differentiation of themselves as a separate master race ruling people. And you actually see that, I mean, again, to sort of illustrate the historical analogy, uh, the Manchus become obsessed with Manchunas mm -hmm. about three generations after they've conquered China. Mm -hmm. It's only at that point that they start to say, OK, well, no, this is a distinction that absolutely needs to be maintained. Or, and there are direct historical analogies, there's this fear of sinicization which they understand as going native. Um, so that's one of the things I found so fascinating across the cases is that there are the same pathologies or similar pathologies of colonial governance in both Asian and European cases. I've got time for one question, David. Thanks, Andrew. I'm going to give you back off some of the other questions about the kind of danger of reading logic or strategy mm -hmm. from outcomes, mm -hmm. and particularly <laughs> reading a logic or a strategy from an outcome where your outcome that you're very interested in is a particular one about mm -hmm. empires and reproduction, whereas there's obviously lots of other things going on, kind of with said about yeah. capitalism, but there's lots of other stuff going on there too, mm -hmm. and about how you choose to bracket off things as not being about the core part of the question, and then reading a core logic and strategy in a way that to me seems a little uncomfortable compared to someone like Al Ferguson who I disagree with a lot but mm. he thinks ideas really matter a lot and the substance mm. of the ideas really matter a lot and not the strategic stuff but the things mm. that people really believe mm. whereas for me it seemed like a lot of what you were talking about people didn't seem to believe a lot of things in your narrative they simply <laughs> adopt strategies that either work or don't for them in maintaining power over larger groups and their community groups which is the outcome that you've already take on to be the object of study? Yeah, that is a frustratingly smart question. <laughs> uh, and I have very limited time to address it, so <laughs> rather than just sort of play till we get to time. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, what I would say is, I mean, I think that you've nailed a real weakness in the argument as I presented it today. I'm more confident of the way that it articulates in the book manuscript, because what I focused on today is the institutional architecture of imperial governance by accenting the diversity regimes as being central to that. Uh, and if you focus, as I did today, on what are the imperatives of imperial statecraft and what are the results, then that starts to look like a very 
uh, bloodless Machiavellian kind of story. Mm-hmm. One of the things I did find most fascinating, though, and which I articulate in some greater detail in the book, is the idea of the particular visions of empire that inform these projects. Mm-hmm. Um, and there always seems to be a very, again, sort of a Janus-faced element to that, of balancing that sort of imperative of ideological outreach and collaboration versus differentiation, because these are all alien conquest regimes. Um, There's always a recognition of the need to maintain that separateness and distinctness, but also a need to actually maintain the kind of soft power that will enable them to sustain a degree of support. So what I do in the book is to say, okay, well, the Mughal, British and Qing empires all have particular visions of rule ideologically that they develop. Um, and again, even you know, if you if you want to be finicky about it, say, well, ideology that sort of sounds a bit sort of self-conscious and strategic as well. Um, I have less of a problem with that because you know, I very much kind of evoke a deep constructivist tradition theoretically in engaging that. Um, where it's been more difficult methodologically is that in order to fit everything within the frame and the word limit that I've got. Um, you end up accenting certain periods as being representative of a whole in a way that might be problematic. So for India, I say, well, Mughal India is Akbar's India. Um, For Qing China, it's the Qianlong Emperor's China. For British India, well, then that's Hastings India. Um, And obviously the problem with doing that is that you manage to actually get the ideas back in, but you lose a lot of the sort of temporal dynamism and the (coughs) contestation of that. But I've only got one book, so... Andrew, that was fantastic. Oh, thank you. Please join me. <laughs> Next week, we have the Steel with Team Pulses and we have Sarah Percy. So I look forward to seeing you all next week. You guys are a much scarier audience, I have to say, in a good way. Like, people have tough questions. Yeah, good questions, though.